to, to escape a job, it's like, well, go create a secondary income that, you know, at some point, a year or three down the road, it doesn't make sense to go to work anymore. You, like the smart thing to do is fire your employer and double down on the entrepreneurial thing that's working. Yeah, my, I, that makes a lot of sense, you know, and uh, a couple a couple advantages that you might already be thinking about, or if not, I'll put a couple seeds in your head that uh, you will start thinking about is, um, you know, you, you're going to, well, you, you know, some of the tax advantages that you have in real estate and you'll learn more, you know, but um, you, you, there's a lot of tax advantages in real estate that you can't do in any other industry. There's, there's a, you could have a lot of leverage in real estate in a responsible way that you can't do in any, you know, that you, I would never ever do with a stock portfolio or, you know, I mean, look, look, there's, there's, there's ways that you, you know, even in like foreign, uh, in real foreign exchange, not like a forex trader, but, you know, like foreign exchange professionals, people that like steady currencies professionally, and you know they, they went to premier schools and they understand finance, and that's what they do is currency arbitrage, you know, like like Wall Street type, not like internet foreign exchange trading, forex, forex. But I mean, you can you can have a hundred times leverage, so even small moves can make big outcomes. Um, but when something goes against you, at a hundred times leverage, you know. Yeah. You know, if something moves 1% down, then your account went down 100%, you know? So that's not a, a situation you ever want to be in. So, but you know, in, in real estate, you can use other people's money for leverage at relatively low interest rates usually, and you can make a lot of money. Yeah, and you can do it in a responsible way because real estate prices don't tend to move dramatically the, the way that, uh, you know, public markets do, that, you know, currency, currency valuations or stock valuations, you know? You know, some people talk about gold, you know, you know, Derek, is gold a good investment? And be like, I mean, I, I like some gold jewelry, but as far as like, you know, I don't own a bar of gold. I don't own a fucking, despite what you might think, I don't own a fucking swimming pool full of gold coins. Um, I, I, I don't think it'd be a good investment. Um, it felt like that one. <laughs> despite my affinity for Scrooge McDuck, I don't yet have a swimming pool full of gold yeah. coins. Um, but, you know, you, you think about that if, you know, if you had a fucking a, a gold bar just for for easy math, you know, if you had a gold bar that was, uh, you know, a million dollars in gold at current market price, you know, well, for the same million dollars, you could probably buy you know, just $10 million in real estate, you know, right. and for the, with that $10 million in real estate, you know, you, you still have the exact same, uh, you know, inflation hedge with the gold or real estate that you'd, you'd have a generally equal expectation that they would move together with inflation that, you know, so, so you know, as if, uh, if the dollar got devalued 20%, that those things would inflate 20% to, and they have, you know, similar purchasing power over time, you know, except you did it 10 to 10 X it. You have 10 times leverage in the, in the fucking account. Uh, they have $10 million instead of $1 million. So if you had that million dollars in gold, now you're paying storage fees, you're paying, uh, you know, it doesn't make you anything. <coughs> So you have the same currency inflation hedge, you know, plus you have uh, um, tax benefits that you can write off, you know, on you know, rental properties, you have 27 and a half year amortization schedule. So you can write off, you know, 3.6% per year. Even if you, if you make, if you, even if you make money, lost money, whatever, you still get to take a three and about 3.6%, the value of the property minus the value of the land, which is not, uh, you know, depreciable. The value of the property itself, the, a the asset itself on the land, you know, divided by 27 and a half years. It's about 3.6% per year. So you get that as a tax credit, essentially. I'm using that word loosely, but you essentially get that as a tax credit that uh, co comes off your income taxes. So you have tax advantages that the gold bar doesn't make you. You have, uh, you have uh, the same inflationary hedge, you know, and you can multiply the fucking portfolio. And it's like, I don't know who the f wants to own a, a gold bar. So, you know, there's the number one way that people create with a million dollar or higher net worth, the number one way that they got that, you know, was real estate, you know, and then number two would be various financial markets. So, something I tell a lot of the guys, uh, I'll let you jump in one sec, but something I tell a lot of the guys, and, you know, th this is exactly what I did is like, you go make some entrepreneurial money, you know, if you get a person that has a normal career, so we'll start making a fucking secondary income and, you know, and fuck, fuck around with that and fuck around with that. And you, know, you might have to try 10 things. You might try six things, 12 things. 
find something that hits that you can make a secondary income and, you know, and then find another one and, you know, and grow those entrepreneurial money. Uh, and yeah, you get to a point where your entrepreneurial income outweighs your, outweighs your salary or you get to a point that you're, you're making 50 or 60% of your salaries value in the entrepreneurial income. And then you look at your job and you're like, why the fuck would I show up at work again? when I could free up that time and double down on this and make twice the money, you know, triple this and make you know, twice the money that I was making at work and do it on your own terms and do it in a way that leads to more rapid growth. And if you did well in a business, and it, they don't have to be extraordinary numbers, bro. I was like, how much do you really want to spend in a year right now at this stage in your life? Like, you know, even if you increased your living expenses by 50% and bought a few more luxuries and a few more trinkets and whatever, like, how much do you really want to spend in a year right now? If you're making a million dollars a year, would you really want to spend it right now? Or? I would just spend it all on mentoring and more training and just in or to save it as an, in an account so I can invest on future opportunities. You, know, you can live a pretty damn comfortable lifestyle for about 10 grand a month. Oh, yeah. you know, for about 10 grand a month, you, know, you, could, you can fly around, you can eat whatever you want, you can live in a pretty nice place. For about 10 grand a month, you can live a very comfortable life, really, you know, Absolutely. for a younger person. I, you know, if, you, if you're making half a million a year, if you're making 300 a year and, you know, and living off of 100 a year, you know, and you're putting that other stuff and you're, the, you're either buying real estate and then leveraging it or buying uh, you know, stocks or other investment assets. Um, you know, there's a time that, although you might have that entrepreneurial income where you're putting away a couple hundred thousand a year, a couple hundred thousand a year, a couple hundred thousand a year, you don't have to make millions and millions of dollars in entrepreneurship. If you're, putting a couple, couple, if you're making a couple hundred thousand surplus that you were investing in something, then same as the job situation, it's like there's a point where you don't have time to do entrepreneurial things that you don't enjoy. There's a time where your investment income is, is your primary income. Your money is making you money. You don't have to work for money unless it's just your hobby and you enjoy doing it. You see me talk for countless hours, but like, I really enjoy hanging out with smart people. I like meeting the people here. I like doing this. But, and to the extent I don't like it, I'm just like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. So, you know, and find your version of that. But it doesn't have to be, when you hear entrepreneurship, you're just like, well, I don't have an idea for the next Google. God damn it, you got 10 ideas that you could go make 300 grand a year with. Yeah, I've already done that experimental phase. I've tried a lot of things, catering, <clears throat> photography, social media. This is where I ended up. This is where I'm planning my feet down. Like, this is where I find myself make money here and enjoy my time doing it and put a lot of effort into it. Yeah. So don't make it more complicated than what I just said. I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but like don't make it more complicated than that for any of you. It's like if you had an entrepreneurial, you know, if you to to escape a job, which sounds awful lot, you know, that sounds like a real shit life to me. I, I don't want a, a traditional job. Um, I never wanted a traditional job. Um, to escape that shit, it's like, well, go create a secondary income that, you know, at some point, a year or three down the road is going to fucking outweigh your fucking, your employment income. And, you know, it doesn't make sense to go to work anymore. You, like, the smart thing to do is fire your employer and double down on the entrepreneurial thing that's working. And you don't even have to do that for your whole life if you don't like it. If you, if you did that for a fucking decade, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, like, these are low goals, okay, guys? It's like, if you did that for a decade, and you paid for your living expenses and lived a, more, a bit more comfortably than you were, but also put away a couple hundred grand a year. You know, pretty soon you got a million dollars. Pretty soon you got a couple million dollars plus the compounding that happened from the first savings and year two savings and year three savings and year four savings. And if you were kind of a schmuck, you still might have three million dollars in a decade or so. You know, and you, if you had three million dollars and you have an opportunity like just happened in the markets, you, you can turn three million into eight million or, you know. Over a three-year period, four-year period, you could turn three million into two and a half or four times that, you know, and, and pay a capital gains tax instead of ordinary income tax. You know, so pay pay you know 20 percent capital gains plus Obamacare tax and the whatever the hell the first amount is ninety something hundred grand whatever this year's numbers are. Um, so you know, be paying three thirty twenty three point six percent twenty three point eight percent instead of fucking. Uh, you know, 40% if you made the same amount of money in, uh, or more. You'd be paying 39% federal again, plus uh, whatever the state taxes are. California or New York, you could pay more than 50% of your income in taxes, you know. And, and then, it, it, that's just income taxes. And then what's, what's, what's left over 
then you get to pay property taxes and taxes on your cell phone and sales taxes and, and more taxes and taxes and taxes that 60% or more of your income goes to taxes. You know, if you do that in a tax advantage way, you're doing way better. Yeah, another 15.3%. So, you know, in case, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overcomplicate it, but if you did that, you know, you don't have to make extraordinary, you know, huge sums of money. Sometimes when you talk about entrepreneurship or growing a business, some people get in their head like, well, I don't know how to grow the next Google. Well, I don't either. I don't either. And you don't have to. You don't have to. Like, you're, everybody here is smart enough to go find a, a few hundred grand a year. And, uh, you know, if that turns into millions a year, that's great. Fantastic if that turns into millions a year in entrepreneurial income. But you know where you can go get that? You can go get it in real estate. Take that money and you invest it. You take that money and you invest it. You roll over the investments. Like, it's, this, this is not a hard thing. This is like, you know, tested and tried and trued forever. But the catalyst for, for this economic turmoil versus the last one are very different, you know? In, in, the, in the, you know, 08, 09, you know, really property prices didn't recover in Vegas until, I, I, I feel, you know, if I had to put a, put a fucking mark on the calendar, I'd say April 2013 is about the time that I'm like, you know, the, the bargains that were here through 2009, you know, and the best bargains were in, you know, 10, 11, 12, you know, 11 was like the things that didn't sell, people were really desperate to sell because they might have had them on the market for 500 days and there was still a lot of foreclosures. A game that they played here, just to give a little context, a game that the banks played here, um, you know, the, you'd, you'd see 21 to 23,000 REOs, you know, foreclosures on the market. And, you know, the, the reality of that, there's about 20,000 more than were, than were listed, uh, you know, at the same time, that they'd trickle them out, trickle them out, trickle them out. And I think part of that, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't. I didn't, I didn't have you know inside information on this, or somebody told me. But my intuition is that, you know, some of the some of the banks didn't want to put everything on the market at the same time because it, it creates even further deflation in their values, and then they have to mark to market, you know, do it in real time, and write it down on their balance sheets, you know, in real time rather than, um, you know, trickling it out, trickling it out, you know, main, maintaining some pricing integrity. So, but you know, in the, in the current situation, um, we had more stimulus than, than even Obama did. You know, the, the TARP Act was uh, 700 billion or something the first, you know, I'm going from memory from a decade ago, but the TARP Act was something like 700 billion, the first money, and then they had, you know, several layers of QE after that. How much was it? You know the number? TARP? Yeah. I think it was something like 700 billion the first time, but you know, they were talking about trillion dollars. But you know, trillion, the, you know, now it's you know we just it's like seven trillion dollars in no period of time, and uh, so I, I you know, it's kind of what I said to him is like, I don't I don't think you're going to have that same devaluation of the properties because they devalued the currencies instead, you know. So I, I don't think you're going to see prices necessarily go down, um, or at least not a lot, a lot. I agree with your consolidation statement that there's going to be some properties that are going to there's going to be bankrupt and some properties that'll get consolidated and. Uh, you know, there'll, there'll be some bargains in there somewhere. I was living on my coach's uh, living room on a mattress, you know. I ended up, like, just bouncing at a bar. I'd been a cop, I quit my job. And... Derek Moneybird presents Ten Commandments of Wealth. Took, took the gamble on myself to become a successful uh, professional fighter and make it to the UFC or pride in that time. And... Am I making a sacrifice right now? Or am I just in investing in a better future? So it's easier for me to do those, to make those decisions when I think about it is like, oh. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, I, and now that you mentioned it, having to actually really process and think about it. I think that word sacrifice is kind of like, I believe it's the word that the ones at the top kind of use to make everyone else feel better about it because when you're at the top, now you realize that that was an investment. Was everything just golden and easy and handed to you, or do you have a little struggle with yourself along the way? No. Yeah, within, uh, in 2013 and 2015, I was living out of my car, you know, full time, and I was too proud to ask for help. Like, how ridiculous is that? You're living out of your car, and you think you know it all. And 2015, that's when I kind of hit, I knew that I didn't know it all. 
So why not find experts in that and really shortcut that? I thought I was going to just chip away. I thought I was just going to read books till I was an expert. Mm -hmm. you know, I never really talked to anyone that actually did it. So it's been about a week since I've joined the 10 Commandments of Wealth program, and there's so many interviews that are offered in this program. I'm inside the Derek Moneybird 10 Commandments of Wealth program. This is an awesome program that you're gonna love. I'm gonna use the principles and the knowledge from this program to help me boost my leads in my marketing firm. Buy this program, it's a wonderful investment for your future. You won't regret it and you'll absolutely love it.